this episode, we will be discussing the topic of sexual consent, which means that this podcast episode may not be appropriate for all ages, for all listeners. Please listen with discretion. And as a result, because we're talking about the dynamics of power and sexuality, inevitably there will be conversations around how that power can be misused, including abuse or assault. So please consider this a content warning at this time. If this is something that you are sensitive to and is not in your best interest to listen, we encourage you to listen to one of our other podcast episodes. We hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Novelty Podcast. My name is Alexandra. And I'm Emily. And I read primarily from the perspective of like literary criticism or like your English literature class. And I read from the perspective of uh, writing and editing. So we like to say I read from the perspective of what the writer owes the reader. And what the reader owes the book. So today we have a really interesting concept to talk about. This was the topic that you came up with, actually, and I think it's going to be a great conversation. I am a lover of romance novels, and mm-hmm. I'm not, not denying that at all. But in this day and age, there's been a lot more discussion about kind of what consent means. Mm-hmm. I don't know why we still need to have this conversation, <laughs> but being both a reader of romance and then kind of like looking at the writing perspective and looking at a lot of like romance writing communities and stuff, I've come to realize this is something that people don't really think too much about. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of having that discussion about like the romance genre in general um, and the power aspects of it and kind of where it started and, you know, I'm in the place of where it's at now type of uh, situation. And we just started having like a really interesting conversation on that and all of a sudden it was like, should we record this? (laughs) Yeah. That's usually how this goes. Yes. (laughs) Oh wait, we forgot to talk about our tea. Oh no. Here we go. Today we are both having... Twining and no, not Twinings. Harney and Sons. There we go. Harney and Sons. Uh, London fogs. Yeah. Because I do like a lot of cream in my tea. I have an absolute liter of it. So. <laughs> well, you have to have the bigger cups for the London fogs, so you can put lots of tea and lots of cream. Yeah. You know, so that's why that's why you pull out the big mugs for these. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you know when you kind of look at the history of the romance genre, you see how there is tension in the two concepts between power and love and really trying to work out how does a power dynamic affect the romance of the story the love between two people and how can we negotiate out love which should be freely given we have this sense that love should be freely given hence consent and yet we're aware of the tension of power well because there's always going to be some kind of power imbalance in a relationship like that's just undeniable even if you go down to like there's usually a physical power and balance, and that's mm-hmm. just a part of nature. Yeah. But usually there's also like age or wealth or social status. There's right. always some kind of power and imba- balance that has to be kind of negotiated through, mm-hmm. or if we're talking about negatively, it's just taken. Yeah. And one of the early sort of works that I had read about the medieval romance, which is really where we see the origin of the genre of the romance story. So when we look at like literature and at least in the western canon uh, previous to the romance you really have the epic story which is about loyalty and fealty between um you know a leader and his subject and usually it's like in the context of war or an adventure or something like that but those are the, it's a very male focused story it's usually right. between male characters and the relationship and bond brotherhood that they have amongst themselves but even back then you immediately start seeing the power dynamics mm-hmm. of it like ho- like who am I comfortable in essence? Because when you're a follower, you're in essence like giving yourself to that person. Mm-hmm. And so then that was the idea of like the nobleman who's worthy of being, of these people giving 100%. themselves to. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have, you know, poetry that's coming out where it's sort of like lamenting that you don't have your Lord anymore, or even the Iliad itself. The very conflict is about what's called time or honor in, um, in the Greek culture of like, Agamemnon is a bad king. He's a bad right. leader. And so Achilles doesn't want to give his fealty. He doesn't want to give his loyalty. He doesn't want to give his service to Agamemnon. That is the whole point of the right. Iliad. So this is like kind of core to the epic story. Sorry. And then we get into the medieval romance. And it is about navigating this question of how can there be romantic love between a man and a woman? Because, of course, it was that was the framework given this hierarchy Mm -hmm. and for the medieval person you know philosophically and theologically one of the huge concepts of the time was the great chain of being and so this would be literally a triangle of authority and it's represented in their art you'll often see it on like um 
uh, the, uh, what, I want to say like the mantle that would go above the uh, an altarpiece. There you go. Yeah. Um, in the altarpiece where you would have this illustrated, but it's basically, you know, God at the top and all of his archangels. And then you would have the Pope and all of the church hierarchy okay. below that. And then you would have the king and his court and all of the people below that. And then they would even do it with animals and minerals and all of these sorts of things. So the, the great chain of being was this idea that you're connected with God through the chain of being, through this hierarchy of power. So this explicit hierarchy is like very important to the medieval concept of religion and philosophy. Then you have stories like Tristan and Isolde come through, or even the Arthurian legend, where you have this repeated triangle of an affair is seated right, right into the beginning of the story. So um, Isolde is married to King Mark, but she has an affair with Tristan, her true love. Same thing with Guinevere. She's married to King Arthur, but she has an affair with Lancelot, her true love. And this is an articulation of the way in which they're putting forth this idea that a woman cannot love where she's commanded. Mm. Because King Arthur is her king, she and cannot that's how she how, views him. Exactly. How can she willingly or purely or with her free will give her love when so much power is embedded in their relationship? She can only give bestow her love down the social hierarchy. Right. She can so since she's the queen, she's actually in a higher position than Lancelot, and that's the only way that a woman could purely give her love. And the same thing happens obviously with the Isolde Isolde and Tristan love triangle. And they are kind of definitively coming out and saying Power, you know, Fs it up. <laughs> when there's power in the relationship, <laughs> and it, when the woman is in a position of less power, she can never really give her love in a true and honest and pure way. It's always commanded a little bit. It's kind of an interesting like, to think about, like, even in medieval times, they're basically saying, like, love, to a certain extent, requires equality, at least on mm -hmm. some level. Yeah. Like, or... You know, at, at the way that we would kind of put it, and and the and it's kind of bound up in Christian theology as well. Is like you would have to give up your power, right, in order to meet that person there, and that's kind of like the Christian ideal of the love of Christ is that He submits, He gives up His power as a divine being, and submits and comes into this world, and that's what makes agape love such an ideal, especially again in this medieval conception, right. But it's kind of hard to apply to kings yeah. and queens and human beings. <laughs> right, yes, indeed. And so then I kind of wanted to kind of talk from the medieval conception. Then we get into like 1700s. And so one of the first novels, or one of the no books that's up for contention for the first novel of the English I'm language. Fight this one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is Pamela by Sam Samuel Richardson. And it's actually written as an epistolary novel. It's kind of in that early stage of us kind of figuring out what form fiction's gonna take. Right. And it's this, and it's a chonker too. It's a big old brick. But it's it's actually pretty entertaining. It's lots of drama, ups and downs and lefts and rights. Very plot heavy. Are there scary houses somewhere? There are scary houses. Yes. Okay. We're okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I ha there's actually this hilarious moment that I'll talk about in a little bit. But the basic plot is that Pamela is a lady's maid in a in a woman's house, a noble woman to a noble woman, but she dies and her son or her nephew or somebody comes in and he's like the inheritor of the estate. But there's no lady of the house. He's not married. So there's really no position for her or to a hold. A lady's maid. Yeah. So she really should go find employment elsewhere. But he keeps like delaying her and she's like, she was so beloved by the lady and she gets like some dresses and a few gifts and stuff like that as part of like what happens when she passes. And he's like, oh, you are so wonderful. And then for a little while, it's like, oh yeah, you should go be the lady's maid for my sister. But then he kind of blocks that from happening. And slowly, you know, and pretty, I shouldn't say slowly, but pretty quickly into the story, he starts really coming after her and, you know, kind of cornering her in rooms and kissing her and forcing her to kiss him back and things like that. It's very salacious. <laughs> and the whole novel is about, and the subtitle of it is Virtue Rewarded, Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. Which, I mean, like, I love that old time novels need to have like an or. Like, yeah. it's not just the subtitle. It's like, if you want to call it Pamela, okay. If you want to call it this, also okay. Yeah, and the second title is always like a paragraph right. long. Right, because Pamela, what does Pamela really give you about I know. It? Like, you need more than just that. Yeah, they were very heavy handed on what, the, <laughs> what you should get take out of this book. So 
the and it is a very moralizing tale and she keeps saying no she keeps saying no 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 and she is very firm she doesn't let him take advantage of her but finally he sort of like gets so frustrated he whisks her away to his country house where she's isolated and by by herself so it gets a little gothic That's at some house creepy no not and, at all <laughs> and she keeps saying no she keeps saying no she keeps saying, for like 600 pages he's like <laughs> i'm really into you and she keeps saying no and then finally he's like fine i'll marry you and then she says yes and then they can and then her virtue, virtue is rewarded. rewarded. And so, you know, it's strange as a modern reader to take a look at this. And it's like, this is a person who has kidnapped you, harassed you, assaulted you. And in the last 30 pages, you want me to believe that she's happily married to this man who has been victimizing her for like four years and 600 pages. I like, because this is something we're going to talk about later, but like, this is like, this such a like long standing through through like plotline with novels that as long as it ends up happy, everything else is okay. Right. Like, and we're definitely going to believe it's totally possible for you to be happy in this situation. So everything else kind of gets wiped away because they were happy in the end, right? Yeah. Epilogue, 30 pages. You right. got it. And then, and one of the sort of wink, wink, nod, nods of like trying to be kind of sexy at this time was like they leave dinner early and go up to <laughs> le chambre <laughs> and that's sort of like look at how happy they are in their marriage right, they're yeah. this young virile couple if you will going up to but the funny thing okay so this is like one of my pet peeves about um epistolary novels which i've talked about before but this novel also has this problem where because you have to imagine this person like sitting Same, down oh, yeah. and writing. So she writes letters to her parents, but she also does like diary entries. And so while she's like trapped at the manor house in the countryside, like it's sort of like this gothic situation. And she tries to escape several times. And one of the nights that she's like trying to escape, she's like looking out her window, but she gets terrified because there is a bull outside, <laughs> which is like. Okay, Again, okay. maybe sort of like a sexual metaphor. She's afraid of the virility of the male bull, you know, or whatever. It's all very thinly veiled. <laughs> but then, like, in your, like, in my mind, what happens when I, like, read these books is, like, you get this sense of, like, oh, she's sitting down and writing, and then she goes over to the window to check, and, like, oh, the bull's still there, and she's scared, and, and then she back. Back and, like, <laughs> scrolls down what's happening next, you know? And so there's, like, this impracticality to the, to the narrative framework. Not really wanting to stay within, like, the reality of what leather writing would look like. <laughs> right, exactly. But they also, like, have to follow the conventions of, like, telling the events of the story, but because of the framework it like it gets a little choppy <laughs> i mean yeah that was a age of like where you feel like we're, we're working this whole thing out we're yeah. just seeing what works and we figured it out pretty quickly that doesn't work yeah that it doesn't not... work for a novel <laughs> yeah jane austen was right to change pride and prejudice and just be like no nah. <laughs> we need actual like narrative here yeah, <laughs> narrative is good and um so that's like sort of one conception that we have of Femininity and Samuel Richardson is obviously a male author and I think we see the misogyny in this framework where it's like on the one hand, you know, she is she's blushing and she's humble and she's like, oh, the Lord couldn't pa possibly be paying attention to me. I'm just a lowly servant. Like, no, he's not really interested. Meanwhile, he's like trapping her in rooms and like kissing her against her will. How he's not really interested in me. He's how could he take advantage of a poor little girl like me? Well, I mean, yeah, because like obviously what we're playing out is if he could have just like ha had his way with her yeah <laughs> and then gone on his merry way like he would have been fine with that in the yeah. beginning it took a really long time for him to be like oh fine i guess we'll get married and i'll right. like give you the status in society so that you're not mm -hmm. a you know ruined woman but from the sound of what you're describing he would have been fine oh yeah with her being a ruined woman and moving on with his life right exactly and so you know there's like this sense where the woman is articulated as like this extremely innocent humble pure and yet she still and even though she's like powerless in this dynamic she can still muster up the power to say no 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 which like in reality would not happen if there yeah. was a young woman stuck in a lord's house like that she can't actually say I no know. well and also to me is there just like an aspect back to where like virtuous women save it, you know immoral men because in essence by her like waiting until he asks her to marry him she's also saved him right. like now he's going to be a faithful husband instead of this like guy who's going around forcing himself on women yeah yeah and so yes exactly so her purity call requires him to kind of match her in her virtue right, right, yeah you know and then 
I also like the idea that like he's the type of guy that's doing this to his house house servants. But he's definitely just going to stop because he's married this one. Yeah. Like, that's the end of it. He's yeah. heir of his ways. Yeah, it's just, Pam, you know, Pamela's just so beautiful, he couldn't help himself. And that's the other way that it's really built, is like, oh, the temptation of womanhood, you know, right. it's it's something that he can't even help himself about, you know. And so that in itself is a problematic worldview about, like, the nature of men. So then Henry Fielding wrote sort of like a response novel that's a spoof of it. And they were contemporaries. He lived during the same time. A novel called Shamala, which is actually like really hilarious. And so I like that they were doing that. They were trolling each other way back when. Yeah, like this and is that what one humanity like, does. <laughs> it's like much shorter, but still a great read if you want to if you want to read it. And it reimagines Pamela as not this woman who is classy above her station, which Pamela also learns how to read. She shows that she's intelligent. She shows that she's more, you know, again, right. this this special chosen one that it was actually worthy of marriage by this lord. She continues to sort of like prove herself as being worthy of this status right. that he eventually accords her with. Shamala, by contrast, she's like, she's very, you know, savvy and she's very, um, like street smart, but she's not very like book smart. And so she keeps calling virtue her virtue. You know, she's very low class and she is like aware of everything that she's doing with the Lord. And so in these scenes where it's like the Lord sort of comes in to try and like kiss her or whatever, she's like, oh, it was so funny. I just pushed my boobs up a little bit. And then he was immediately just <laughs> hot. And she's like laughing about him like behind his back, which of course goes back to that classic line uh, from Margaret Atwood, which is like, women are afraid that men are going to rape them and men are afraid that women will be laughing at them, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a, this articulation of this male paranoia that secretly women know the power that they have yeah. through their sexuality and they're using it on purpose to try to make fun of men, to laugh at men, and to ultimately um, manipulate, you, them. manipulate them in order to get access to power and money, which Shamala also eventually tricks this lord into marrying her and she is, still gets rewarded she still gets rewarded but she knows what she's up to she's not innocent she doesn't actually have real virtue she just her virtue <laughs> and she thinks her virtue is her virginity only and like <laughs> anyway so it's just really funny and she's constantly mispronouncing words and things like that and so this in its own conception is sort of the same misogynistic worldview on like what the power dynamic Very means weird, between yeah. men and women around love but he puts it on the other end of the spectrum which is that oh women have all this power over men they have the power to say no they have the power to tempt them they have the power to like manipulate them into doing things that they don't because, really like do. this guy is just powerless in his attraction to her right he's just let around by his ding dong yeah <laughs> <laughs> you really really can't help myself okay right, right. <laughs> and so i you know i think when we look at all of these sort of historical novels, they really do trickle down into the way that we still write modern novels. Oh, absolutely. You, like if we're talking about this being like early, early novels, we're still dealing with these things today. Um, so one of the things like I do when I, like I'm looking for new novels, I like, you know, read a lot of reviews and stuff like that, just because these themes show up as like positives in novels yeah. to this day. And I'm like, I just don't, I don't even want to, deal with this I realize there's like a whole like subset of books that people online are referring to as like dub con and non con and I'm just like still kind of bowled over by the idea that we have fancy terms for like I like to read about women being raped like that is what we're saying here when people are like oh I'm just so into non -con. I'm like you're into books about women being raped can yeah. we like if you if you are actually into that please just say that yeah. like let's not play with these these and, names and they're not like intended just as like sort of a a, a power fantasy that only men read this is no, like mostly female readership really, readers yeah I, I don't understand that at all <laughs> but um this is definitely an issue that we still like still see in romances today and often being sold not necessarily not always as like oh it's a reward for virtue but just like like oh like being forced there's something cool about that there's it's something, something hot about yeah that. exactly and i'm just like how are we still here <laughs> and to be clear there's a difference between rape and having a relationship that is consensual with where dominance and submission is a part of right. that dynamic right no we're talking about people thinking like it's really cool to read stories about women being forced and and also like this we've actually developed a like genre based around like D 
dubious consent Mm -hmm. and exploring that. And that makes me really frustrated because I feel like there are so many women who are put in situations where like, it's not like a clear cut, like I know what to do. It's very emotional. Mm -hmm. And for us to make like that an entertainment is like honestly frightening for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's like why I chose one of the books I wanted to talk about today was the Vikant and the Vicar's Daughter by mm-hmm. Mimi Matthews, who have actually, I've read other books by Mimi Matthews that were completely different than this, and mm-hmm. I really like them. So I don't know what's going on with this book. Yeah. But the entire book centers around two characters who have wildly out of control power imbalance. So the main female character is about like 19 years old. It's the first time leaving her family. Her family has died, and she's like now the like a lady's maid in essence. Mm-hmm. But like, Week one, yeah. you know, she's has no social experience whatsoever and is also at the bottom of the social rung. Yeah. And it's also like if she's a vicar's daughter and she's without family and protection, she's already kind of come down a yeah. rung or two to now go into service. Because if she was a vicar, vicar's daughter, yeah, she wouldn't have been wealthy yeah. or like a lady or anything, but she would have not had to go into work. Work, exactly. So that's our, like, heroine character. It's just a straight-up romance novel that's taking place in the Regency era. So, heroine, so then we have the Viking. hero, yeah, the Viking enter, and he's like in his mid 30s, so mm-hmm. like that's a significant age gap right there because of how young she is, yeah. just to start with. He's, you know, described as having like a lot of sexual experience, mm-hmm. he's had a lot of women, mm-hmm. he's been out in the world quite a bit, like he yeah. knows, you know, knows much more about the world just in general than her. So, you have this like Right off the bat, like, I'm not very comfortable with, like, the way they're portraying this. Plus, of course, literally, he's a Viscount. He's nobility. Nobility. He's, like, the highest power structure that you can get in a world. So they end up at, like, this party together, and he immediately decides that her virginity is attracted to him. Like, we're not really, like, there's not really any illusions. Like, he's, He's like, basically, like, like, I like having sex with virgins, and you are one. It's more like, I've never had a virgin before. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) This is interesting. Yeah. So he, like, corners her at one point. And tries to convince her that, like, he just wants to kiss her. And mm-hmm. she's telling him, like, no, I'm uncomfortable with this. Like, that's, like, I can't do that in my position that I'm in. Right. And he is both using, like, physical force and, like, leaning over her. And then also, like, pressuring, pressuring, her. pressuring her. And she finally, like, just kind of gives in in this moment of, like, he's putting a lot of pressure on her. And then, of course, like, he immediately takes it from, like, small kiss to, like, really heavy kiss. And it's kind of treated as like, oh, but she liked it, so Mm -hmm. it was okay. And it was like, I'm very uncomfortable with the way of like, well, it's fine if, you know, she likes it at the end, Mm -hmm. right? And it was just like... Well, and it also kind of puts this spin on it of like, he knows best. Like, she mm -hmm. thinks that she doesn't want to be kissed, but wait till I show you how hot it can be. And I'm going to show you like the ropes sexually and ultimately you're going to like it because of my sexual prowess. Right, right. And so it's like, I really also don't like that. That aspect of it. (laughs) But then like what she was afraid of happens. Mm -hmm. She's seen and immediately gets fired. So now she's got like nothing. Mm -hmm. And his response is like, well, fix it. You can just marry me because I actually kind of need a wife right away. Mm -hmm. So fixed. And she's just like, but I don't want to marry you. I literally just met you. Right. You know, like I had... She's totally telling him, like, I had plans for my life. Like, I was going to save up money. I was going to go abroad. I was going to work for this organization. And he's just like, well, can't do that now, can you? Yeah. Yeah, Because, like, I've just ensured that, in essence, you have no way of supporting yourself. Right. So it just becomes this very uncomfortable novel that's played as straight romantic all the way through, Mm -hmm. where he starts, like, controlling every aspect of her life. Mm -hmm. And her choices basically come down to, like... She can either go live with a, like, elderly spinster family member mm-hmm. who wants to make her into a very specific type of person. Because mm-hmm. um, she's, like, you know, an old school, like, you know, women's rights in the Regency era woman who just wants a niece to stand by her. Yeah. You know, which is portrayed as very obnoxious. And you're just like, well, that's uncomfortable in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> or she can be this guy's wife. Yeah. And throughout, he's very controlling of, like, everything about her he starts picking her clothing out he demands that she like tell him her entire romantic history and gets upset because she was like momentarily engaged to one other person while he's talking about like all of his Mm -hmm. sexual conquests about the whole thing and ultimately like she does choose to marry him she consents to Mm -hmm. marry him but there's never a point where you think that she's doing this because she loves him it's just down to like 
this is the best choice because the other choice is is neither choice is the same good mm -hmm. but w i have like a better shot in society if i marry him yeah and then the novel ends with but he really loved her so it was all okay and it was like there's no point where i felt like she had a choice in every anything and like it, everything was her being forced into something and you know he is systematically hemming in what little power she might have right such as the power to make money or the power to go travel or the power to go you know fulfill other aspects okay. of her life you know it's interesting because really by that framework the medieval stories are more i know progressive <laughs> than where like you know guinevere gets to choose where she loves and even in a christian society right. it's portraying like that it must be in the form of a of an affair that's very interesting right that is it really is like the idea because like this novel almost puts in perspective of like the most romantic thing is ending up rich yeah you know like she chooses the the place where she at least has like some Money. financial power and like potentially some like personal power mm -hmm. you get the sense from who he is throughout the novel that she's still going to be controlled because he's a he's not the kind of person that yeah. likes just going to let her do what she wants like he's picking her clothes out for her yeah you know but it's like well but she ended up rich and he's kind of dotes on her so like yeah. that is like the highest that you could ask for in romance and it's like how in the 2000s yeah. do we think that this is romance? But it, it's just played straight. Yeah. And I don't think that this is like a strange outlier book that I, I happened upon by accident. Like, yeah. this is like a, a long-standing idea that like women are satisfied with romantic relationships yeah. if they have money. And it's also like in sort of like contemporary novels too, where you see like, oh, it's the rich billionaire and he comes into your life and she's kind of not as powerful or not as rich. She gets all of these sort of like, she gets access to these types of experiences that she wouldn't normally have, have access, access to. Yeah. And then she has to kind of be convinced, you know, oh, kind of, oh no, I don't really want it. And, and so then it's like, well, then it's like, how does, how does that not ultimately support the Shamala worldview Real, of like yeah. women are just playing coy this whole time. Right. I mean, in that case, Mr. Collins is right. <laughs> you know? Oh man, we don't want to be in a world where Mr. Collins is right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is remind this, that plot line is kind of reminding me of a novel that I need to look up really quickly because we need to discuss impromptu impromptu. Let's okay. do this. Um, and I can't think of the author's name or the name of the book. But he wrote Jude the Obscure. That's Thomas Hardy. So novels by, we're gonna do this. Oh, sorry, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Oh, I've, I've heard people talk about this. Yes, I think, because um, again, this would be, this is a classic Victorian literature um, written, let's see, when was Tess of the D'Urbervilles published? As we just like lean in. Here. Yeah, <laughs> 1891. Okay. So again, this would be like another example of a novel that, okay, let me just, clean this up. So the novel that you're talking about here kind of reminds me a little bit of Tess of the D'Urbervilles. There's a, another additional character who is an important counterpoint. So there's two male leads in mm -hmm. that story. Um, but she also has to face, she's actually raped very early on in the novel and she has therefore her loss of virtue. And then she has to like navigate the world mm -hmm. having been sexually assaulted. That's what the whole story is about. It happens early on. That's not a spoiler. Also it was published in 1891. So yeah, you have to you just accept it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, but I think this is again a story like it's portrayed as like this is completely unfair and completely tragic. This sort of fallout that she has in her life as a result of the power hierarchy that men control and the way that women's sexuality is tightly controlled and virtue is so important right. and all of that. And it's shown as like completely unjust and horrendously tragic. Like Thomas Hardy books are like, don't read it unless you're in a really good state mentally because they are just like, you're like, oh, you went all the way there. So I ask if he's okay. He's doing okay, John. <laughs> like, so, like, heart. <laughs> Not, nothing will be left of your heart by the time that you're done with Thomas Hardy novels. But again, it's like, it seems to be a more progressive vision of this where it's like, it's recognizing that this is a harmful part of our society. Right, right. Well, and there's also like an aspect of that book that I really dislike that like, 
the idea that like virginity is what matters the most because mm-hmm. we're not talking like when we say virtue when we're talking about these things like it's just the fact that she hasn't slept with someone yet right. we're not talking about like anything to do with like her as a person or her character or her integrity her or... personality like you know yeah. do i actually even want to spend time around this person right. it's just simply the fact that she hasn't slept with somebody therefore i want this person as if that's like some like weird trophy that we can have and that in and of itself is like very it's really uncomfortable. Yeah, it's really. And there's also there was also like this kind of purity culture aspect of it, where like she is like being in forced into like a very unattractive appearance, right? Because mm-hmm. she's the ladies' maid, so she's just wearing like you know hand-me-down clothes that don't fit her, and she's got her hair tied back really tight because she's just doing work. And like he's like, but under it all, like her virtue makes her attractive, and it's like, no, it doesn't. Her virginity, her obvious virginity, does not suddenly make all of her, like, the rest of her just gorgeous. Like, you're just like, oh, no, no, no. Like, definitely nothing else matters but that virginity when it comes to sexual attraction to people, you know? Right, yeah. And I think, you know, we talked about this in the last podcast or maybe the one before that, but it's sort of like we have to ask this question, uh, and I think really Jane Austen is nudging it. (laughs) But, yeah, I think it was when we were talking about persuasion, um, which is like, when we talk about the marriage market that is a transaction of money and power over access ultimately to female sexuality how is that different from you know the oldest profession Mm -hmm. right right it's the socially sanitized socially acceptable version of that same transaction right and i think that's why consent becomes such an important conversation because it moves it away from transactional to relational right right like does she have any say in this whatsoever Mm -hmm. Because, like, she's obviously not in this household, like, looking for someone to pick her up out of her circumstance. Like, she's very clearly being described as someone who is, for one thing, in the midst of grief. Mm-hmm. So she's extra vulnerable. Mm-hmm. She's fresh on grief. Mm-hmm. And is just basically trying to tr- survive the situation she's in. And I think that, like, makes it extra predatory because he can, like, see that she's, like, really sad. Mm-hmm. So she'll kind of be an easy mark because, like, mm-hmm. oh, he knows how to cheer people up. Yeah. When really he just kind of is, like, verbally abusive and thinks that that's funny. Yeah. You know, and I just was kind of, it's like one of those things where you, like, think that things are getting better and then you read stuff like that, which I think that was written like in 2009 or something like that. And you're just like, it's not getting yeah. better. Like we're still here where we don't understand that there's no consent going on here. She mm-hmm. is a character who's clearly being portrayed as having no options. Mm-hmm. And, but we're like, but it's happily forever. It's like, she said yes. So like, well, did she really say yes? Or did she just say, well, like this is the best shot I got. So I guess I'll take it. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, to kind of portray that, in a romantic light, to view sort of this, um, and and it's also like it's the female suffering. She's right. put into these sort of extenuating circumstances that are extremely strenuous, you know. And then that's the motivation for a decision is that sh- that pressure, right? And and again. Not to keep continually bring up Jane Austen, but we just talked about her. So Why it's not? Fresh. Let's do it. You know, you do see characters who are in um, tense situations, right. whether it be like Marianne and Eleanor, or whether it be the Bennett sisters, or something like that, where they have to make certain types of decisions because of the pressures that are under them, mostly financial. Right. And yet, Jane Austen goes the other way. the The way that they get to have resolution in the end. Yes, it's through marriage. Yes, it's through the marriage market. Yes, it's through money. Yes, it's through that same hierarchical structure. She's not dismantling it as such. Right. But they are doing it through staying true to who they want to say yes to and who they want to say no right. to they're in not, the face of pressure. They're not having to like give Succumb. up themselves. Yeah. yeah. Or, like, you know, because like part of the thing that's expressed with her is like she's actually like, uncomfortable with the idea of being married to someone at that level of Mm -hmm. social status because she can't be herself she has Mm -hmm. to like be trained up to be this person so she's in essence like fully giving up herself just to survive Mm -hmm. but then there's like kind of this romanticization of the concept of being like wealthy and noble and it's like totally okay that you have to give up who you are because you get to be like you know the princess Mm -hmm. so what does it matter who you are as a person and what your wants were as a person you get to be the princess, right. so it's all okay. We can just give up ourselves. Right. So similar to Pamela. Ah. I know. <laughs> and, I, and I too, I think there's this other component too where it's like, 
I can't quite put my words to it yet or put my finger on it, but it is this sort of, um, well, it's the glorification of the men kind of coming in and rescuing her. Yeah. And it's like what she needs to be rescued from is not her lack of power, but her lack of wealth. And it's like, that's actually, you know, and it seems to, like, I can't quite put my finger on why that's like a mismatch because it's like, you know, for Pamela, she just wants to be able to do her life. Like, she doesn't want to be rescued out of right. her circumstances either. She She's working hard. She's sending money home to her family. She knows that it, she wants to get another job. She wants to go be a lady's maid with somebody else. Like, those mm -hmm. are her goals. Right. And, um, you know, and this man kind of intercepts what sh her life path is as she sees it for herself. And she's supposed to just say thank you. Right. Even though it's, like, not what she wanted it's not what she envisioned. Well, I can't And she gets tortured in the process. Does that not, like, kind of play into, like, this classic, like, girls might think that they want a exactly. career, but what they actually want is a husband who will take care of them. But, hence the Shamala response. Yeah, it's like, exactly. oh, she really knows. She's just being coy. Yeah. Or, or you either play it as, oh, she's just being coy and she she's pretending like she doesn't really want it, hence the you know, Mr. Collins response. Oh, I understand women are supposed to say no the first time that they're proposed to, but really they intend to say yes. Or it's the, I know better than you. You think that you want ABC, but really you want me. Yeah. And I'm going to show you through force that I was right. Right. And that, that you want, your fulfillment will be better. You will be more, these, what you think is going to fulfill you, that's shallow because yeah. ro like love and like romance, that's what really fulfills a woman. Yeah. Yeah, you think that you don't want me to kiss you, but let me sh let me lay one on yeah, you, and, and then you you're going to be really yeah. into it. <laughs> and that the narrative agrees with it is like... Well, I, I like that, like, in the case of the book I'm talking about, like, she's like, no, if you kiss me, you know, someone's going to find out and I'll lose my job. Mm -hmm. She's right. That yeah. absolutely happens. And even then it's like, oh, but it's no big deal. Yeah. You know, it's like... <laughs> Like, does nothing that she has matter? Because no matter what it is, it's always like, well, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Like, nothing actually matters, you know? Yeah. And the, I, it goes back to, like, a long time ago, someone had me watch the movie um, Some Like It Hot, mm -hmm. which I had always been told was a great comedy. The entire plot line is that women want money and men want sex. Yeah. And that is it. Nothing more than that. And I'm just like, how do we keep playing? The, like, every time yeah. I read one of these books, it's just like, yep. That's where we're, we're back there again. Women yeah. want money and men want sex. And that is, that is our foundation. But I don't understand why that's romantic. Yeah. Like I don't under, as someone who enjoys romance novels, mm -hmm. I don't get to end the story and be like, oh, that's so romantic that she's yeah. rich now. <laughs> yeah. And I do wonder about it too, because you know, obviously that this book is written by a woman. So then it's like, oh, well, where, where are you coming from right. as a woman yeah. to like, reinforce these kinds of views but and i understand why a samuel richardson or henry fielding are like coming right. out with misogynistic books it's like yeah you were writing in the 1700s and you're dudes and i don't blame you for that but like i also do wonder like fundamentally for men it's like do you really want to believe in your heart of hearts that the woman that you're with wouldn't be with you unless you had money i know right that's sad yeah, like how is this a happy for it, either person? Yeah. Like how, how do you honestly, I mean that's kind of like the the reality of like with romance novels when there's always like a little tie up at the end where everything was happily ever after and it's like, well these characters are probably going to be together for like what, if it's like healthy lives, like another 40 years. Yeah. Can you honestly project this out as this would be a like nice companionable relationship for the next 40 years, which when what brought you here was like, I was looking for a leg up in society. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. You know, or vice versa. I was looking to control you and I forced you into my man yeah. house in the countryside where I terrorized you for, <laughs> yeah. you know, eight, nine months. How is this just going to magically work out? Yeah. To, well, and also like, even when we go into like the straight up, like non-con relationships, um, books, which, you know, there are plenty of them weirdly. Tell me one time in real life in which a woman has like fallen madly in love with the guy who raped her and the guy who raped her fell madly in love with her and they just had this great relationship. There's no reality there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And for me, books that have like books that are telling you they take place in the real world, but are so wildly divorced from reality. It's like, this is unreadable to me. Yeah. This is, you, we're not, we're not even writing fantasy here. Yeah. It's very strange. You know, that's basically the problem with Pamela, too, is, like, how, how am I supposed to, like, you've spent 
600 pages establishing this guy as like forcing himself on her and terrorizing her but then i'm supposed to just flip it and be like oh aren't, aren't i so glad that she ended up with this person right and the idea that she's glad that she yeah. ended up with this person if like through this whole thing like she's honestly terrified by the situation and be like no actually i'm all down with this right <laughs> so strange Okay, well, tell us maybe are there examples on the other side that we can talk about? On the other round, because fortunately we do have positives. Um, so, the book series that I chose to highlight for this is the Harrow Fair book series by Catherine Ann Kingsley, which I always put like out in advance when I talk about Catherine Ann Kingsley books. Is she is a horror romance uh, novelist, so her adult content ratings are very high. <laughs> this is a very niche audience. Please read trigger warnings before you start this, <laughs> because she is she's very her books are very complex, but she does she's just a, is a straight up horror writer sometimes. Um, but this series, I felt like it's a, it's actually is a paranormal, um, and yet somehow I felt like it was more like the aspects that we're specifically talking about are more based in reality than yeah. most like no this totally took place in Regency era type of situation. Um, so brief plotline. We have the main character is Cora Glass, who has had several traumatic things happen to her, and she's kind of given up on life. Mm -hmm. And one day she decides there's a circus that's rolled into town, and she decides she's just going to go to the circus and just spend an evening there, because what else does she have to do with her life? It turns out the circus, like, maybe likes people to stay forever. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And she might be there for a long time. <laughs> a little something wicked this way comes inspiration, mm -hmm. maybe. Exactly. I think she, at the end of the novel, is referring to it lovingly as the man-eating murder circus. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things, backstory, so we're gonna, I'm going to give like small spoilers, not major ones, but small spoilers. One of the parts of the, her story that we learn you know, throughout is that she's a sexual assault victim. Mm -hmm. And something that I really appreciated from the start that Catherine Ann Kingsley did was it wasn't, oh, I was like out one night too late. I was, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I was with the wrong people. There's nothing like that specifically triggered this. Right. She was sexually assaulted by her boyfriend, mm -hmm. which I don't think we talk about enough that most women are assaulted by somebody they trust. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, kind of discussion around that of like when this happened to her, you know, she tried calling the police. She tried talking to friends, you know, and being like, this happened to me, like someone needs to listen. And a lot of people in her life from the police, like even people she thought were friends being like, well, I can't really, like, it's not really rape because mm -hmm. he was your boyfriend. Right. You know, that's not really a thing, you yeah. know? And so like this drives her in a lot of ways to shut down because not only did this terribly traumatizing thing happen, most people are telling her like, it well, didn't really happen that's like not, that. That's not that's not really rape. You can't yeah. really you can't you can't be raped by someone that you're in a relationship with. Yeah. So I like appreciated from the very start that like this was something that was brought up. I honestly have not while I've read many books in which like characters are assault victims, I've never seen that. Where it's like, let's be honest, like women are usually harmed by people that they trust and that's mm -hmm. how they are harmed because they trust this person. Yeah. So I appreciated it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. The romance plot itself I found was very interesting in that a lot of it is about the two main characters, so Cora and the man she meets in the circus, who's also trapped in the circus, <laughs> Simon. Um, their characters kind of negotiating their power back and forth throughout the novel, and I thought that was really interesting that was even like addressed because so many times like it's just kind of like assumed mm -hmm. that like these power imbalances like exist and we're just going to accept them so for like one thing there's a significant age gap because mm -hmm. simon is like 100 years old he's been in, you know trapped for a long time she's like in her 30s but simon was trapped at a very young age in this circus so even though he's like much older than her she's actually had more life experiences than mm -hmm. him so it becomes kind of like this interesting like combination of you know that power imbalance they have, at the beginning of the novel, obviously have a physical power imbalance because Simon's a man, he has more physical power. And she basically just tells him, like, I'm not comfortable being in a relationship at all because mm -hmm. of what happened to me, but if I'm going to be in a relationship with you, I need to have the power for a while because I'm too afraid to mm -hmm. do this. And he actually says, okay, yeah, and gives it to her. And so, like, the whole novel becomes, like, kind of their back and forth on this, and it's Honestly, it was like kind of refreshing to be like, oh, we're actually going to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be like, oh, no, it's fine. You're fine. Yeah. You're in a relationship now, so you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. That also is becomes a thing. Even in romance novels that I've like obsessively liked, mm -hmm. but there's like this idea of like, oh, well, she had trauma, but now she's in a relationship, so it fixes it. Like she yeah. feels all better. Whereas like in this series, like both 
characters have had things happen to them. Simon's like kind of portrayed as someone who has like long running mental health issues. Mm -hmm. She's obviously got some serious trauma and they come into the relationship with like, we're not here to fix each other. Mm -hmm. Like we can't fix each other. I'm probably always going to have problems. We're companions, right. you know, like that's what a relationship is. It's not a fix. We're not yeah. going to be better just because, you know, we, we fell in love, that right. type of thing. So it's a really, I, I was, there were a lot of things about it where I was like, this is really refreshing that yeah. we're not like just being like, well, I'm in love, therefore I am yeah. not traumatized anymore. Yeah. And it's sort of, and it, you know, there's so much about our culture that positions women in particular as like, your life has been fulfilled through finding romantic <clears throat> stability. <clears throat> You know, finding right. your partner, committing to them, and, you know, presumably having children as well. These are, like, the tropes that we see sort of pushed forth as the purpose for women. Which right. is why it's so upsetting when we see someone like the vicar and the viscount, where, or the vicar's daughter and the viscount. The vicar and the viscount would be a different yeah. novel. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> um, where it's like, she has purpose and goals that must completely be abandoned in order to fulfill the romantic ideal. Right. And the same thing for Pamela. She must, she has purpose, purpose and goals and things that she's trying to accomplish in her life and they must be completely abandoned in order to fulfill romantic ideal. Right, right. I also do appreciate, I feel like there's this kind of trend right now where we are wanting in fiction to talk more about sexual assault and be more open about that topic. Mm -hmm. But that has led to a lot of people being like, They'll just throw it in there as a backstory component. Don't get me started on Ninth House. <laughs> did I know this would start? Yes, I did. <laughs> there has been a spicy conversation on my TikTok. I don't know why people are fighting me on this. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been as offended by a book. Mm. Like, there's not a lot of times. I, like, I'm very clear on like, hey, this wasn't for me or this isn't to my taste. And I really differentiate that between things that I think are high quality and things that I think are, are low quality or, right. you know, and I think things can be fun while not being that great. This is a book, and maybe it's because I've gone through trauma. Thankfully, I've not experienced sexual assault, but I have trauma in my background. So I know what trauma feels like. Right. And I feel like I have never <laughs> been so, like, deeply offended by the way that... Um, trauma was used as a plot point yeah yeah fundamentally that's what it was there's like two okay. we're gonna we're, we're Do going it. into it oh no no because i got one i feel the same way about that all of a sudden i'm like yeah we gotta talk about this <laughs> yeah where it's like okay where the main character experiences repeated and ex quite extreme trauma but the, and there's nothing wrong with including dark elements in your book. Being open about these things happen to people. Right. And and using storytelling as a way for us to reckon with the difficult circumstances that many of us experience. These are things that happen to real people. And we use art and literature to explore these ideas, to try to understand them, and hopefully to transmute them into something better, maybe some healing, both for yourself as the writer or creator, and maybe even for the audience that they can relate to that experience and get he healing through it. Right. That's like really the best use of the arts to kind of encounter these types of things. On the flip side, when it's handled in this clumsy way, I'll call it clumsy, but deeply offended by it. When I read stuff like this, I often think to myself, and you know, I don't know Lee Bardugo, I don't know what her background is, but my first impression is, oh, you must not have really experienced any of like anything like yeah, this but, before yeah. because otherwise you would know that a character can't have this and this and this and this and this happen you know in the first 14 years of their lives right and then they're just plucky miss sarcastic going about their life with no consequences with no real consequences on the page or in her personality or in yeah. her life or whatever it's one thing to say oh i'm gonna have my character encounter something really difficult and the point of the novel is for us to walk through, through that, that. Yeah. with that character and say, oh, here's the way that they're depressed or harmed or struggling or healing or two steps back, three steps forward, right. how it affects their relationships with their family and friends and other people in their lives because it suddenly comes into their life and, and trauma changes everything. Right. It colors your entire universe. Yeah. So it's just like, I'm really, really angry about it because, you know, one... I feel like it becomes a convenient plot point for the author to say, this is the character you're supposed to have empathy for. Right, right. And so I feel manipulated. 
Two, I feel like, oh, you are using something that's deeply painful for many people as yeah. a trick in your book. Right. It feels, You're, it feels very cold in a way. It feels very cold. It, and there's like a tone mismatch because you're dealing it with it with such flippancy. Yeah. So that also really, like there's a bunch of different ways in which it bothers me. And I really, Ninth House was one where I was shocked. I was mm. absolutely shocked. And, you know, and, and the funny thing is, is, I mean, it was an extremely popular book and I watch a ton of book talk, booktube. Like right. I consume a lot of online content and people are just... I well, talking about it like oh isn't it a fun like dark academia book like oh and we went on a little adventure there's a child rape scene on the page early in the novel not one person said oh the trigger warnings <laughs> and it's like yeah like obviously it's dark academia I was prepared for it to be, be have dark elements in it but I feel like you should say hey trigger warning for child essay right you know yeah I mean it's almost kind of like a how do you say it like a deminimizing mm -hmm. of like this idea that like yeah. that's just part of life people this happens to them it's and not she bad. was okay and she, she was fine it's fine yeah and I think too it was interesting because one, some of the pushback that I got when I sort of like started talking about how upsetting it was to me is like people so the what happens with the child scene is that um, our main character is someone who can see ghosts very sixth sense like and so this situation is the first time that she physically encounters a ghost so a ghost is perpetrator mm. and so it, uh, someone wrote in my comments me talking about how upset I was about this oh, she gosh. was like oh I thought the point of that scene was to show that the ghost could now physically interact with her by raping her right that's like, the only way yeah that we could have shown this <laughs> they couldn't bump shoulders with her as she's walking down the street how freaked out would you be if you bump shoulders with a ghost or what if it yeah her hair you know and you're yeah. like oh my gosh no nope. <laughs> that would be we gotta totally go. effective Full on in there. And then it's like, to me, how is it that a reader is walking away from a child rape scene, explicit, on the page with descriptions of the violence, saying that was the point of that scene and is not right, disturbed right. by it? It's because of the tone mismatch. It's because right, she deals with it. she's not being portrayed as having any side effects of this. Exactly. Yeah. No, I. that is a huge part of why I appreciate the characters of Hero Fair because, like, this isn't just like, oh, in my past I was raped. That's part yeah. of my backstory. It's like, this is contributing to why Cora is like show shut down and yeah. can't trust even people in her own community because exactly. she feels like this one event, like I like kind of uh, like dominoed multiple things in her life. Yeah. And it's like, yes, like if this happens to you, it absolutely affects all areas of your life and eventually affects how you start responding to the world. Yeah. That's a responsible yeah way of putting this type of thing in a story rather mm -hmm. than just being like i feel like it's kind of an attitude of like a lot of people i know were sexually assaulted as children you know yeah it's like well n no that that's not that okay it, that that it is um something that happens more frequently than we'd like to think mm -hmm. does not then therefore make it something that doesn't have gravity exactly the frequency of it doesn't make it less harmful right exactly and yeah, okay and i'm just gonna like lay it out there Bring this it. isn't so the main character's name is alex her whole name because <laughs> i think this is so stupid <laughs> her full name is galaxy oh no <laughs> but she goes by alex my name is alex so i'm mad about it, <laughs> it particularly offended but um you know the the rape that she experiences is not the first thing in alex's life and Okay, so just the rape alone, because it's so gratuitous, it's so over the top. Like, so the circumstances are, Alex has a hard time making friends because she can see ghosts, so she's upset and she's sad and she has a hard time interacting with the world because she yeah. has this supernatural experience that nobody can relate to, including her own mom. So her mom is a medium, she tries to tell her mom what she's experiencing and her mom doesn't believe her and shuts mm. her down. So, and she's a single mom. So Alex has no one in her life um, to support her. So yeah. she's a very sad little girl. We also see like early on in the, a lot of this is told like in flashbacks or in memories mm -hmm. from Alex, who's now about like 18, 19 years old and it's in college. And one of the flashbacks and stories that she tells is an experience of seeing a, an adult male ghost, um, pleasuring himself while watching children play on a playground. That's oh. literally a memory that she relates. Gosh. There's also another situation where little Alex in like third, fifth grade or whatever is having a conversation with another kid about male genitalia and she sort of has this flippant attitude about it. Like, oh, I've seen that before. 
So you now know that Alex has had multiple experiences where she's been exposed to male ghosts in a, a sexual assault Sounds type of situation. Today. Yeah. Yeah. And you, uh, then she finally makes a friend in like seventh or eighth grade. She has her first friend that she's been friends with, and they go on a uh, school trip. And on the school trip, uh, they you know ride on the bus together. Blah blah blah. She goes to the bathroom. It turns out it's the first day of her period. While in a public restroom in a strange location on this school trip and that's where the rape situation happens how gratuitous does that not seem like so over the top gratuitous i mean like i kind of feel like asking the author like what is your obsession with this child and like sexual things yeah like why why is it like so much of like her childhood wrapped around like inappropriate sexual things and that these ghosts are haunting her in this way in this way specifically yeah, yeah. and then because her friend comes in and sees the situation. So then you see it from, or at least me as a reader, I can imagine it from the friend situation, which it, it describes the violence and the blood that's happening in this scenario for the little girl, Alex. And so then from her friend's perspective, she's watching her friend be experience this violence from an invisible force. Okay, this and, is just gross. Right? And then like the teacher's aide walks in or the chaperone or whatever. And so obviously they can't really understand what's happening. And so apparent then, so again, we're supposed to articulate Alex as this, as the character who should be receiving empathy from us, right? right? And her friend, we don't explore like a, how traumatic that would be for Alex. She goes to school the next day. I'm like, a child goes to school the next day after something like that? No. No. She goes to the doctor because she will have physical injuries. Yeah. Right? Um, And then we see that her friend, we don't explore how that might've been traumatizing for a friend to see. Yeah. She's just now a bad friend because she doesn't want to be friends with her anymore. She abandons it her. It can't be that she's another child who's also been traumatized. Exactly. And so then it's like, oh, her friend was not a good friend to her. She went and gossiped about her behind her back as if that would be... Anyway, so she goes and got... And then um, Alex, what she experiences is bullying at school where they put spaghetti on her locker, which is also extremely cruel and, and visceral yeah, image. Is. Yeah. And I just like, I don't under I don't know kids who would be able to internalize right. that and express bullying in that way around something like this, nor do I know a little girl who, if she had witnessed that, would immediately want to tell other little kids about what she had seen. That would be traumatic for her too. True. She would have a hard time talking about it. These are the cases where, like, I tried to, like, not associate the author with their writing, but these are cases where I'm like, what is wrong yeah. with this person? Like, what's yeah. going on in the author's head? Because this is not it's very, something very wrong here. Yeah, it's just, I can't, like, even wrap but my see, mind like, around This is where, like, like, okay, this is upsetting, but then it's also upsetting that people aren't reading this and being upset. Yes. But I think this is where we get into the culture of like, has, did you know that dubcon and noncon are genres? Yeah. And it's like, we've, we've created this world in which like, it's totally cool to read books about women and children. And I mean, we have Bridgerton, so now men being assaulted yeah. and that's just like part of the plot line. And we don't yeah. really talk about it other than it's just part of the plot line. And we've somehow like completely, trivialized it. Yeah, we've desensitized ourselves to it. We've right. made it just be like this is just part of fiction. But when it happens in real life, like we've been conditioned to trivialize it and just treat it as just like a plot line. So then, how are we serving women? To, like we're the still victims of anything. anything. Yeah, yeah. Like this is like why we get into situations of like women in real life telling me like, oh, well, I just you know this happened to me, but I just don't talk about it because. Yeah you know, no, no one wants to hear about it. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, well, we've turned this into like a fantasy thing. Yeah. You know, we can't, we can't actually like even, you know, process it ourselves because like, well, that happens in books. That doesn't yeah. happen in real life. Right. It's just, it's so <laughs> angering, you know? And especially again, cause like I've gone through hard things in my life. You've got through hard things in your life. Thankfully, I mean, nothing like that, like, right, right. you know, and she had, and then there are other, you don't even want to know all the other hardships that she's gone through <laughs> that are non, not related to sexual abuse. And it's like, I know how hard I had to work for my healing. I know how difficult it was, how much time and effort and energy and what it sucked out of my life and right. what, what that suffering felt like and how, and how difficult the healing was too. Right. It took a ton of energy. It hurts. Yeah. Healing hurts. Yeah. And so then to have someone just like be, act like this is similar to stubbing your toe. That's basically right. the level that it's treated with. So it's so offensive. Yeah. It's enraging. Yeah. And equally enraging that people don't care. <laughs> yeah. 
And because then it's treated like, oh, stubbing a toe on a page, someone can read that and walk away and be like, oh, it was because she was trying to show that the That's, ghost could physically interact with her. Which, I mean, I just kind of want to ask the author, is that really it? Was yeah. that was that all you were trying to show? Because, like, come on. <laughs> and, I, and I do think this is also another thing that I've seen that's where, because Lee Bardugo, Bardugo is a YA author, and this was her first adult novel. It's a new adult novel, and it's Dark Academia. So I do think it's one of those things where the attempt to establish herself as an adult, adult writer, writer is probably part of what's coming through here, is that she felt like she really needed to be as dark, as gritty as possible. I'm going to do as much adult stuff as I can. Yeah, in order to sort of establish herself and say, like, I'm not just a YA author, but it's like... This, like anybody who's a victim of this, you are actually re-victimizing them with right. this kind of thing. This is not a healthy way to talk about it. No, I, I mean, this is actually making me think of the book that we, I was telling you about just a, oh, a few months ago, or um, the uh, it was called the Stuff of Nightmares. It was the Sherlock Holmes slash steampunk transformer book that I read. Yeah. But it was the same sort of thing. The entire novel breaks down on there's these two guys who have steampunk transformers, and they need to fight for some reason. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? We're going to have them fight over a girl. Yeah. Why are they fighting over the girl? Well, because the bad guy sexually assaults her to death. So mm -hmm. now they're going to fight with each other. And the girl in the middle never has a voice. Yeah. She is just idolized. Like the good, the good guy just talks about how beautiful and sweet she was. The bad guy just talks about how much he enjoys her in bed. She never is given a voice. Yeah. We never talk about like her experience. She's just there to be pretty and then to be raped and then to die. And now we can fight over her. Yeah. So like it's always the victim who ultimately like gets the, the shortest end of the stick because now we're describing victims as basically like toys that get broken and then we have to fight over the toys. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> that makes me so mad, Emily. <laughs> okay, now let's let's end on a positive note. Positive. Well, you had a a, yeah. a book series that you felt also. Well, I agree with you. I've read the series as well. I agree with you. Is an excellent way of like helping victims because that is what we are ultimately talking about: is people yeah. who are find themselves in non-con situations means they are victims. Yeah. So, and this, actually, you introduced me to this series. I did. You bought me the first one. <laughs> I was like, Merry Christmas, you need to read this. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. And it's lore. It's very popular. It's the graphic novel, um, well, our graphic webtoon series now published. You can find it in all your bookstores. Art is amazing, and the story is amazing. Um, and so in this story, we have a Hades and Persephone retelling. Right. Um, and one of the elements of Persephone's backstory, or actually it's not her backstory, it occurs throughout, throughout the story, yeah. yeah, is that there is an assault situation. Apollo, you know, really pushes himself on her one evening, and she then has to deal with the fallout of what that looks like while she's sort of in the budding romance with Hades, who she's just starting to fall in love with and they're just starting to get to know each other. Right. So it you see in this story, and I think it's very tenderly done, and obviously it's a graphic novel too, so even the way that she uses the visual storytelling in a really sensitive way to portray what has happened, but not in a not in a graphic way, in a very sensitive and artistic way. Well, and I think also... in kind of going back to the story I was talking about, in a way that's, like, believable. It's mm -hmm. Persephone hasn't, like, gone out on the town and gotten drunk yeah. and, oh, like, she's in her home and she's yeah. just trying to, like, live her life. Right. And, and also, I think, really, what it comes down to is that it centers her. It centers her experience. It centers her story. She goes through different emotions. It affects, it comes up in different elements, you know. Different things trigger it. Right, and it comes up and it affects different ways that she relates to people. It affects the way that she relates to her friend, who's sisters with Apollo. Who's Apollo's sister? Aphrodite? No, 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 no sorry. Um, I always know the Roman names, so I don't know. I know. It's like Diana, but... Diana, I mean. yes. Who, the Greek version of Diana. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it affects her relationship with her. You know, it affects then her budding romance. You know, it has this sort of multiplying effect that's very realistic for people who have experienced something. Right, because like it betrays someone who, like, has had this, like, really negative experience in romance. And though, even though she really wants to be in a positive re relationship, she's terrified because, mm -hmm. like romance has now been associated with something horrifying for her yeah. and so it's like it's not a matter of like well now i've had a positive relationship so, so all I'm those fixed. yeah all those feelings go away in actuality being in a positive relationship is honestly triggering her because she's terrified mm -hmm. yeah and i think it also gives a really good example for 
Hades' character, he helps her, and he's not perfect, but he does a really right. good job of being a supportive partner through what she's going through. And right. it's a really good example for other people in real life, if someone you know, either as a friend or as your romantic partner, has experienced something similar, it's a really good example of the way that you can love them in a tender and thoughtful way that's really helpful in healing. Well, I really like the one of the things that, one of the many episodes that happens where like, when Hades first finds out, he gets like really angry at first. Yeah. And then when he calms down, he was like, I'm sorry, I made that about myself. And yeah. I'm not, I, I understand, like, I'm not the victim here. Because there is kind of like this, you know, attitude that can kind of be expressed both like, you have the good guy and the good girl, and she tells him this, and he takes it as like, my property has been touched. Exactly. And it makes it about him and his property was damaged. And like Hades has that moment and then steps back and is like, actually you're the victim here, not me. Yeah. Which I really appreciated that moment. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of little moments in here when she tells a friend, when she's working through her relationship with her friend, Diana, <laughs> but the Greek version, <laughs> you know, where she has to kind of work through um, you know, what that means and, and what happened and, and why right. and, and how she's going to process it emotionally and how that affects her intimacy. And there are times where she wants space from Hades. And, yeah, and still living in the same town as the person who victimized her and having to, like, encounter him, him at different you, times. Yeah, like, that. this is this does not just end with the assault. Yeah. Like, this goes on with you and becomes, like, kind of, as much as you would prefer it not to be like, oh, this becomes a part of me, like, it does mm -hmm. become a part of your story. Yeah. And I think it was just really well done. Yeah, Laura Olympus is, is beautiful. Yeah. And it's a really well done story on multiple levels. Also, just love the characters. Yeah. <laughs> well, is there anything else that we want to say about consent, romance, power, how we t tell stories about it? I would say just like, okay, I'm going to take it from the perspective as a, of a writer. Yeah. If you were writing a romance story or a story that has a romance plot, like, honestly think through who humans actually are because yeah. that is like a huge part of writing a romance story so you want characters to actually behave as humans could someone honestly fall in love with somebody who's victimized them like really really think that through and also really think through like are you okay with excusing violence against somebody by being like well but ultimately he loves her so mm -hmm. it's okay like yeah. really i think that we really need to see an end honestly mm -hmm. to the dub con and non-con because really what we're saying is hurting people is okay and like we can just ignore victimization like those mm -hmm. to me like speaking to a writer community like this needs to stop yeah and i would really challenge writers to because the conclusion is what tells you what it means right you know so and this is true for whatever you're writing and whatever your message is but when you think about how you're ending it do, what does the ending mean to you? How does that inform everything that's and happened ending, before? Yeah. Because that's where you get your meaning. The, the final word that you put on the page right. about how this is resolved, because in stories we have a beginning, middle, and end, unlike in life. And so it's this concrete thing that we're saying must have meaning because we've chosen to conclude and it here. Right. And what that conclusion is is going to inform everything that's happened before. Right. So if they end up together, which is essentially your point, it exonerates anything that happened previously right. and, it, and even more endorses it. Right, because it makes it seem like, oh, this assault is what made gave them the happy ending. Right. So this assault was actually ultimately a good thing, yeah. right? And like, we really, really need to like be thinking about what it says about society and the way we treat human beings when we're just like, well, if the rape ends up with a happily ever after, then mm -hmm. is it really a crime? Because we're still struggling with like women wanting to come forward and report people who have assaulted them. Yeah. Because we still live in a society where it's like, but like, you know, what if you fall in love? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I think that, I guess for me, is like, we just need to be so much more responsible with yeah. this. And there are authors out there who are being responsible. And I love you. Thank you for giving us books to read. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Really heavy episode, but I think a really important one. A good one to have. Yes. I'm sure there's going to be lots of comments and questions. Right. I know this is a heavy topic. So do leave comments on the Please. YouTube or email us in the email included in the show notes. Um, and as always, you can find us everywhere that you listen to podcasts. And I'm Alexandra. I'm Emily. And we hope that this episode of 
the novelty podcast maybe you didn't enjoy it but maybe it was informative and worthwhile listening we're just we're here to start conversations absolutely thanks everyone bye-bye